Abraham experienced it and his name was changed. Sarah experienced it and she got laughter. Moses experienced it and he went from hiding to leading. David experienced it and became God's beloved. Elijah experienced it and brought down fire. A savior has come to you. A healer has come to you. A deliverer has come to you. A redeemer has come to you. You will not miss your miracle. Now, it's your time. Experience the supernatural in this month's Global Crusade themed The Glorious Visitation of Christ happening live in Ghana. God is ready to move. Also featuring our ministers, church workers and professional conference team enabling grace and power for the end time harvest. The youth aren't left behind as they are moving upward to higher heights with the Impact Academy. Join us from the 28th to 25th of April at Independence Square, Osu, Accra. The word of power would be broadcast worldwide through satellite, radio, TV, and the GCK social media platforms. We will be blessed by glorious music from choirs around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us together for a Bible study here tonight. We thank you for all the people who are here, old timers and newcomers. We pray, Lord, that you share your blessings in, on everybody's life in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for those who are studying with us all over uh, Nigeria and Africa and beyond. We pray, Lord, that your blessing will be shared upon them too in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep us awake and give us real light and illumination in your word. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to a study in John chapter 7. And today we're looking at verses 40 through to 53. I'll read just a few of the verses for you. I'm reading verses 45 and 46. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And he said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Never man speak like this man. That statement you find in the middle of our study, of our passage we are studying tonight. And he said, never man speak like this man, talking about Jesus. Who could have said to you, never man taught like this man. Never man preached like this man. Never man healed like this man. No other man ever delivered like this man. No, no other person ever spoke about God the Father like this man. No other person spoke about angels, about heaven, and about the road that leads to heaven like this man. Never man did any miracle like this man. Never man walked wonders like this man. Unique in every way. You think about Jesus, you think about his uniqueness. His conception, unique. His birth, unique. His sinless, spotless, perfect life, unique. The betrayal, unique. His response to his persecutors, unique. Going to the cross, crucifixion on the cross, that was unique. And then the last words that he said, all those words of the cross of Calvary, unique. And then his death, as he died, because he came to break the bones of the other people, but he's giving up the ghost already. Unique. He was buried for three days and then he rose again. Never that happened to anybody. Unique. And then when he rose, he appeared to his own disciples. They closed the doors and he appeared before them. It was unique. After 40 days of appearing to them with many infallible proofs, he went to heaven, taking it away into heaven. Unique. After he went away, the angels came to bear testimony. How are you gazing up? This same Jesus is coming again, never testimony given by any angels about any man like that. It was unique. And then he said, I'm coming again. His second coming will be unique. Everything about Jesus Christ, unique. 
You see, the Pharisees, they didn't appreciate Jesus. They didn't understand Jesus. They didn't hear all those things that he said. They were not willing to hear. And eventually they sent these officers to go and arrest him. And when they got there to arrest him, what he was saying arrested them. And what he was saying captivated, captured them. And they came back without being what the chief priest had told them to do. And he said, where is he? We told you to arrest him. Where is he? We told you to go and bring him. Did you see him? They said, yes, we saw him. But he was preaching when we got there. I want to tell you something, Pharisees. He spoke like you never spoke. He spoke, he talked like you never thought. And he revealed heaven, revealed glory, and revealed the heavenly father like you never did. Never man speak like this man. That's why tonight we're looking at this passage titled, the uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior. The uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior. The uniqueness of Christ compels our attention and demands our faith. As we look at Jesus Christ in the New Testament, the word only, only, only is used concerning him. is the only begotten son of the father. We're looking at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and I'm reading here from verse 14. John chapter 1, we're looking at verse 14. In verse 14, it says, And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld this glory, the glory as of the only, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. That's his uniqueness. Look at verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. That's talking about his uniqueness. Chapter 3 of John. I'm reading from verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only, only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. His life was unique, his sacrifice was unique, and the eternal life he gives is unique. I'm looking at First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, we're reading from verse 9. In First John chapter 4, verse 9, here we read about his uniqueness again because it says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son, his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. The only begotten son of God it was unique. Is the only Savior. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Its uniqueness covers every area you can think about. All the spiritual blessings he can give us. The things that he only can do. He only can save. And he only can take us from earth to heaven. He only can qualify us for heaven. He only can forgive our sins. He only can give us freedom. He only can prepare us that we get to heaven. Eventually, Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. That's why it's unique. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And do you know that he's the only mediator between God and man? There's nobody that can mediate between you and God, between you and the Holy Father, the righteous God in heaven, only Christ. That makes him unique. We're looking at uh, First Timothy chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 3. First Timothy chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look at this. For there is one God and one mediator. Not two. One mediator is unique in this mediation between God and man. For there is one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus. Verse 6. He gave himself a ransom. For to be testified in due time. is the only begotten son of God. is the only savior. is the only Messiah. is the only mediator. And is the only sacrifice for sin. Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 26. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. But then must see often have offered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, once in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he's the only one that could do that. And he's the only one who has done that. That makes him unique. Yes, he has given a unique kind of a sacrifice. And it's the unique foundation. The unique foundation is the foundation of the church, of the whole church, of the church from the very beginning until now, until the end of time. There's no other foundation. Jesus Christ is the only foundation that makes him unique. You cannot find a replacement and you cannot find an alternative. This Christ we're talking about is unique in every sense. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For the foundation can no man lay, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. No other foundation. If you want foundation for salvation, that's Jesus Christ. The foundation for your holiness, that's Jesus Christ. The foundation of your qualification to get to heaven, that's Jesus Christ. The foundation of your citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, that's Jesus Christ. The foundation of all blessings that come to your life is Jesus Christ. For all the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid already. That is Jesus Christ is the only son, is the only foundation, and is the only head, only head, the head of the church is the only head of the church. We're told in Ephesians chapter one, verse twenty-two. Ephesians chapter one, reading here from verse twenty-two, it says, "And he has put all things under his feet. No man, no other man like that." It's unique in every way. It says he has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Is the only head of the church. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5. I read from verse 23. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church, the only head, no two heads, not a head in the first century, another head, 20th century, but all through the church age until the church of a rapture taken to heaven. This is the head of the church. And it goes on to say, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject also to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that ye might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. No other person can do that, to present the body, to present the church, to present the bride, to present the believers unto himself, a glorious church, a glorious Christian, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. He's the only one that can do that. He's the only sanctifier. The only sanctifier. The only savior. Yes, the only sanctifier too. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10. If you are going to be sanctified, and you must be sanctified, and thank God you will be sanctified. I'm talking to the church. I said you will be sanctified. Because it takes that to have inner purity, inward purity, inward righteousness, and transparent holiness. And without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. And he is the one that can make us transparently holy and entirely sanctified. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 10. The only sanctifier. By, by the which will were sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. He's done it once for all. He did it on the cross of Calvary so that you'll be sanctified. Look at verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected, perfected, perfected forever them that are sanctified. He's paid the price already. And he's the only one that can do that. You cannot look to a man. You cannot look to an object. You cannot look 
look to your material to sanctify you. You must look to Christ because it's the unique one, the unique Savior, and his unique deliverer, the unique redeemer. It's the unique begotten Son of God. It's the only begotten Son of God. It's the unique Savior, the only Savior. It's the unique sacrifice, the only sacrifice for sin. It's the only foundation, the foundation of the church, and it's the only head, and it's the only sanctifier. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13, and I'm reading from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people. No alternative. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people. There's no substitute. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, purify the people, cleanse the people, make the people holy with his own blood. He suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him outside the camp without the camp bearing his reproach it says if we're going to have this if we're going to have this a sanctification is going to be done by him and it is go it is the cleansing that he does that he gives with his blood that sanctifies us he is the only sanctifier and is the only baptizer in the holy ghost it is not uh, there is not in another person's hand to baptize you to immerse you and to empower you to endure you with power from on high the only baptizer in the Holy Ghost. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I. That's Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was saying, this one is the only, it's only Christ can, that can do this. This is the responsibility of Christ. It's prerogative. I can and not do this. I can baptize with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, greater than I. And he says, Whose shoes I am not worthy to bear, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. He will do it in your life. I said, He will do it in your life. Is the only begotten Son of God is unique. Is the only Savior is unique. Is the only mediator is unique. Is the only sacrifice given for sin to take away our sin is unique. Is the only foundation for the church is unique. Is the only head of the church only. There's no competition with him. There's no comparison with him. The only head of the church is unique. Is the only sanctifier. Is the only baptizer and is the only refuge for your soul the only refuge for soul if you're going to be hidden from the storm that is coming on the final day from the judgment that is coming in the final day this christ is the only refuge you can take a refuge in him and you can come to him and he'll protect you from the everlasting wrath of the almighty god hebrews chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 18 hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 that by two immutable things he which it was impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. We flee to him. We go to him. We run to him. And we take refuge under his sacrifice, under his eternal protection. It says in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, but sure and steadfast, and which entereth into, the, into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is entered for us, even Jesus, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It's telling us about Jesus Christ and I say who we're studying about tonight. We're talking about the uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior. The uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior. Can you say this after me? The uniqueness of Christ. The only Savior. Can you say everything now by yourself? The uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior. It means without him, the best of humanity is incomplete. Think about the best person you have ever heard of. 
the most educated person you have ever heard of, the richest person you have ever heard of, and the most morally good person you have ever heard of, the most generous person you have ever heard of, and the most affectionate person you ever heard of, and the most religious person you ever heard of, without Christ, the best of humanity is incomplete and is not saved and is not prepared for eternity. Without him, the most religious and the most morally good man and the most generous woman and the most celebrated man or woman on earth are lost without hope in eternity because this is what is coming from him salvation comes from jesus only holiness comes from jesus only the ticket to heaven comes from jesus only our refuge under his protection from the devastating judgment of god comes from jesus only and without him you are nothing without him you might be worse than nothing it were better you are not born if if you don't have Jesus because Jesus is the one that gives us the way is the way is the truth and the life no man comes to the father except by him thank God you are coming to the father and you're going to get to heaven and there's only one door there's only one gate through Jesus Christ and thank God you are going to believe and if you believe already you believe more and nothing will shake your face or make you waver in Jesus name the uniqueness of Christ, the only Savior, it will save everyone who believes. Amen. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Come back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, we're learning from verses 40 to 53 today. And we divide the study to three parts. Number one, the discussion and confusion about the Savior the discussion and uh, the confusion about the savior number two the declaration and confirmation of his supremacy he's superior to everyone that ever lived he's supreme and he's sovereign and we learn about the declaration and the confirmation of his supremacy his superiority and number three now the division concerning christ among the separatists a Pharisee. That's what Pharisee actually means, separatist. They separated themselves by tradition. They separated themselves by religion. And they thought they were the best people that could, you could ever meet. And yet, they didn't understand how salvation will come. How they will get salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in their midst, when the light tried to come in, they were arguing about the light. You are not arguing about the light. They rejected the light. You will not reject the light. You are going to receive the light of the gospel and the light of salvation and the light that comes through Jesus. And then you will be saved and you will go to heaven and leave all the separatists behind in Jesus' name. Point number three, the division concerning Christ among the separatists. We are coming to number one. Tell me number one on your notes there. The discussion and confusion about the Savior. We're coming to chapter 7 of John, and I'm reading from verse 40. Chapter 7, reading from verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they had this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet. Many of them, not everybody, not everybody, of a truth, this is the prophet. Look at verse 41. Others said, this is the Christ. Others went beyond what those other people said, and they said, this is the Christ. But look at the confusion now. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? As not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was, so there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. You'll find that uh, these uh, people were divided into three categories, to three groups, and they were discussing among them and this group said, this is the prophet with a capital P. And then the next group said, this is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah that we're expecting. Another group said, but are we sure that that is true? Shall Christ come out of Galilee? 
They thought he was from Galilee. You know why? Because he went to all those cities and villages in Galilee, preaching the gospel to them. And when he came to them, he came out of Galilee to them. And so they didn't understand he was born in Bethlehem. They had not checked up in their history. He was born in Bethlehem. And they were saying, shouldn't Christ come out of the city of David, Bethlehem? Of course, of course. And that's where he came from. That's where he was born. But they didn't understand. They were looking at his ministry. He's gone to Galilee. They came to them from Galilee. And he said, well, Christ come out of Galilee. And he says, as not the scripture said, that Christ cometh out of, of the seed of David, out of the town of Bethlehem, where David was. So there was a division. I pray in your heart there will be no confusion. In your heart, there will be no division. In your heart, there will be no dilly dally in sin. Is see or is see not? Is see the Savior? Is see not the Savior? Is see the sanctifier? Is see not the sanctifier? Is see the baptizer and the Holy Ghost? Is see not the baptizer? Is he going to be my healer? Is see not my healer? Is see my deliverer? Is see not my deliverer? Is see the one that has the power to take me to heaven? Or is another person? Should we look for salvation from him? Or should we look towards another? There will be no confusion on your mind jesus christ is your savior i said jesus christ is your savior and look at what he said when he said that this is the prophet that's what he said and they were referring to look at this deuteronomy chapter 18 and i'm reading from verse 15 deuteronomy chapter 18 we're reading from verse 15 it says in deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 15 about the prophet that was to come in verse 15 it says the lord thy god will raise up unto thee a prophet capital p from the midst of thee that means that it was a future thing the lord was prophesying and the lord was predicting this is prophecy that christ will come and he'll be a prophet from the midst of thee of thy brethren like unto me and then he goes on to say unto him ye shall hack him when he comes he'll tell you what i've not told you but you'll hack him he'll tell you ye must be born again you must listen he'll tell you except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven you must listen to him he will tell you seek the kingdom of god first and his righteousness after that he'll add all these other things unto you you must listen to him he will tell you no man can serve two masters you must reject one and serve the other you cannot serve god and mammon he will tell you that you must listen to him he will tell you that he's going to heaven to prepare a place for you and when he goes to prepare a place for you he will come again you must listen to him look at verse 18 i will raise them up a prophet among from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth that's what the almighty god said i will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that i shall command him and shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name i will require each of him that's Jesus Christ is the prophet. The prophet prophesied in the Old Testament. The prophet predicted in the Old Testament. The prophet that God said he will send. And thank God, Jesus is that prophet. I said, Jesus is that prophet. You say, how do we know that? How do we know that? Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I'm reading here from verse 22. Acts chapter 3 from verse 22, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things. Him shall ye hear in all things. Him shall ye hear about all things. There's no part of the message of Christ that I can say that one is not necessary. That one is redundant. That one is, uh, you know, not applicable today. You will hear him in all 
all things. And that's what Jesus said. You've heard my word. All power in heaven on earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world. And then he says, uh, teaching the people, all nations. And he says, the teaching them, all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you until the end of the world. Everything Jesus has said, everything Jesus has taught, everything Jesus has revealed, were to reveal to the people. Look at verse 22, latter part, whatsoever he shall say unto you, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. It's talking about the importance of the message of Christ, message of salvation, the importance of the message message of Christ, message of holiness and righteousness. It's talking about the message of Christ, message about the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven and how to get to that kingdom verse 24, and ye and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken likewise, have likewise foretold of these days ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying unto Abraham and in the I see shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you first. God, having raised up, tell me, his son Jesus, God, having raised up, tell me his name, his son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Let's come back to John chapter 7. You see some people recognize this is the prophet. But that's not enough. I want to ask them, uh, well, you know, this is the prophet. Have you listened to him? Have you hearken unto him? Have you paid attention to everything that he has said? And do you know that the Father has sent him so that he can turn you away from all your iniquities? Let's come to chapter 7, verse 41. Others said, this is the Christ. Others said, this is the Christ. What did they mean by that? This is the Christ. We're coming to John Chapter 1, verse 41. John, chapter 1, verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. We have found the Messiah which is being interpreted the Christ. What did they mean by that? The Messiah, the Messiah. And, in, and the interpretation of that in Greek and into our language that we understand is Christ. But they in the Old Testament, uh, they called him the Messiah. The Messiah will come. When the Messiah comes, what will he do? Come to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, we're reading from verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. Listen to this. To finish transgression. To finish transgression. Transgression will finish in your life. You will not continue in transgression. And then it says to make an end of sins. The Messiah, when he comes, that's what he comes to do. He comes to take our sins away. He comes to finish transgression and to make reconciliation for iniquity. He comes to make reconciliation between us and the Heavenly Father and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what Christ has come to do. And then he goes on to say and uh, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy know therefore and understand that from the beginning from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the tell me the name there unto the Messiah unto the Messiah that's what you understood the Messiah when he comes he will put an end to sin the Messiah he will finish up all the transgression the Messiah he will forgive us and link us up with the Heavenly Father and reconcile us with God and he says that's the Messiah the Prince he says it shall be for seven weeks that's talking about the dating and the time that will come and three score and two weeks and the streets of the and the streets shall be built again the and the wall, even in troublous times. It goes on to say in verse 26, and after three score and two weeks, shall the Messiah be cut off. That means he will die, but not for himself. He will die. He has died already for your sin. And I pray, as you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, all your sins will be wiped away in Jesus' name. 
Salvation will be real. Freedom will be real. And your forgiveness will be a real personal experience to you in Jesus' name. He came so that he will take our sins away. That's why he's the prophet. That's why he is the Christ. We're coming to chapter 7 of John. John chapter 7. And I'm reading now from verse, uh, the latter part of verse 41. And some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? They were confused. Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And then they went on. As not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and of uh, the town of Bethlehem where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him. Some of them would have arrested him. But no man laid hands on him. It talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord said there should be no division. There should be no confusion among us. You see that confusion, it was uh, from their leaders. The leaders projected that confusion themselves. Look at verse 52. They answered and said unto him Are thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. You see, all those uh, people, all those uh, members of the Sanhedrin, they are called. The leaders and the rulers of the religion of Israel, they were telling them every time, every time in their temple, every time in their synagogue, don't believe him, don't listen to him, because he's from Galilee, he's from Galilee, and uh, no prophet comes from Galilee. That's what these people were parroting. That's what these people were just repeating without understanding. You see, when the leaders are confused, the members will be confused. Confused. When the ministers are confused, the, the members of the church, of the congregation will be confused. Thank God I am not confused. I say, thank God I am not confused. Do you know that Jesus is the son of God? What are you? You are not confused. Do you know that he's your only savior? You are not confused. Do you know that he is the one Christ Jesus has the power, the power to forgive and the power to renew and the power to change your life and the power to bruise your enemy who would your soul annoy. Christ Jesus has the power to raise you from the dead and take you to heaven. And when you put your faith in Christ and there's no confusion, thank God we will meet in heaven. You'll be there. I said you'll be there. You will not miss out in Jesus' name. Uh, look at somebody who was confused. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. He was confused, but uh, Jesus drove and cleared all that confusion away. And whatever confusion you have there today, the Lord will clear everything away in Jesus' name. John chapter 1. I'm reading here from verse... Uh, let's look at uh, verse 44. John chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 44. It says, now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip findeth Nathaniel, and saith unto him, We have found him, we have found him, we have found him, of whom Moses in the law and in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said unto him, Can anything good, can there anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Nathaniel was confused. When Philip testified and witnessed to him, we have found him, the Messiah. We have found him, the Christ. We have found him, uh, the one that will take away our sins and the one that will save us and prepare us for heaven. We have found him. I have found him. I said I found him. He saved my soul. He turned my life around and is giving me assurance in my soul that all my sins are taken away, that I am saved. I have the joy of salvation. I found something that the world could not give me. Have you found it? I said, have you found it? The joy of salvation will never leave your soul in Jesus' name. And then Nathaniel said, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And thank God for Philip, he did not agree. He just said, come and see. Look at verse 47. And Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and says unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no girl. Look at verse 48. And Nathaniel says unto him, Whence knowest thou me? 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. He knows you. I said he knows you. He knows your name. He knows your heart. He knows you are believing. He knows you love him. He knows you put your faith in him. He knows that your confusion is a genuine confusion. And he's going to wipe away that confusion in Jesus' name. As he was coming, Jesus said, Hey, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no girl. And Nathaniel was surprised. I've not been to you before. How did you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you. When Philip was talking to you, when you were under that tree, look at this in verse, uh, in verse 48. Be before that Philip even called you, when thou was under the fig tree, I saw thee. And Nathanael answered and says unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. His confusion went away like all your confusion is going away tonight. All your sorrow of heart is going away tonight. All the delirating, do I go this way? Do I go this way? Everything is going tonight. Who do I believe? What do I believe? How can I get to heaven? And what decision am I taking today? All that confusion is going away today in Jesus' name. And we have to be sure of Jesus Christ that he is our savior. We may be ignorant of many things in this world without any serious consequence, without any painful consequence, and without any life-threatening consequence. But this is the one thing we must not be ignorant of. We must not be ignorant of Christ, the only savior. Christ, my only savior. Christ, my present savior. Christ, my powerful prevailing savior. Christ, my indwelling transforming savior. You must be sure of that. Let all confusion get away from your mind. We're coming back, we're coming back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And I'm reading from verses 45. And 46, the declaration and confirmation of his supremacy. Look at John chapter 7, verse 45. Then said the, then came the officers to the, uh, to the chief priests of the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? Why have you not arrested him? Why have you not uh, brought him here for us to keep him? Then the officer, the officers answered, Never man speak like this man you know what they were trying to do they sought to take him what does that mean they wanted to withdraw the light from the dark world he is the light of the world and then they were looking for him not to get to his light but to take him away from the people who are living in darkness they wanted to withdraw the light from the dark world how wicked they were they wanted to stop the truth from reaching the ignorant the people were ignorant. They've been to synagogue, they were still ignorant. They've been to uh, their temples, they were still ignorant. They've been to their camps, they were still ignorant. They've been to their conventions, they were still ignorant. They'll be to all the religious assemblies, they were still ignorant. And Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life came to them, showing them the truth. And the Pharisees and the chief priests wanted to stop the truth from reaching the ignorant. They wanted to block salvation from damnable sin sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As we see them walking in the street, they are walking corpses. If they die anytime, they go to hell. As you see them on the street, they are damnable sinners and if they die anytime, they will go to hell. And Jesus Christ came to show them the way of salvation. That's what John said. He said, look at him. Behold, the son, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And this Lamb of God and this bringer of of salvation and this giver of salvation they wanted to arrest and hinder block salvation from 
damnable sinners. As you look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see there were people that have been sick and incredibly sick. One of 38 years, another one 12 years of blood, another one leprosy, another one blindness, another one deafness. They were sick. And all these uh, sick people were there and Jesus went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. They wanted to hinder healing and deliverance from getting to the sick and the oppressed. That's what the arrest meant. They wanted to arrest him. They wanted to take him out of activity, out of ministry, out of the great things and the good things he was doing. They wanted to seal the doom of multitudes on the broad way to hell and perdition. These people that were just going on in their millions and millions and millions. And Jesus came to stop that so that they will not perish. They said, go and arrest him. Let the people perish. Go and arrest him and take him out of that ministry and take him out out of that activity they wanted uh, to hinder and to stop the people who were hearing the word of God from hearing the word of God but think about it another way now because it says look at chapter 7 I'm reading from verse 45 then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees and they said unto them why have ye not brought him they sought to take him. But you know, he is the one that will take them eventually and cast them into the lake of fire. The one who is going to be the judge. They wanted to judge him. The one who is going to have the final say in their lives. They want to have the prevailing say in his life at this time. They need to understand that this is the one appointed by the Father. He is the one to take them one by one eventually and cast them into the lake of fire but now they thought they were going to take him look at Matthew chapter 22 Matthew chapter 22 and I'm reading here from verse 13 Matthew chapter 22 and we're reading from verse 13 you will not stop Christ nobody can stop Christ and Christ himself, he comes to help you. He comes to save you. He comes to destroy all the works of the devil in your life. And it is not for you to say, no, I'm going to stop him. I'm going to hinder him. I'm going to arrest him. No, you should not do that. Allow him to bring his word of salvation. His word of salvation, his power of salvation into your life. We're looking at chapter 22 of Matthew. And I'm reading from verse 13. Then said the king unto the servants, Bind him, hand and foot, and take him away. That's what he's going to do finally. For the people that have not repented, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I pray that will not happen to you. I said, I pray that will not happen to you. Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verses 11 and 12. Eventually, is the one to take them. And after all, they had no power in him. They have no power on him. He is the one that has all power, that has all authority. Look at Matthew chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven and the children of of the kingdom the jews the kingdom the children of the kingdom the children of abraham it says shall be cast out into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth is the final judge and is the one that will bring the judgment upon them on the final day they wanted to arrest him no you can't do that you can't do that he is the one that will arrest them eventually and will judge them eventually and i pray that he will not judge you to send you to hell because you have chosen him, you have believed on him, it's your savior, and you're never going to leave him, you'll not forsake him, he will not forsake you in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter, chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 14. Matthew chapter 13, verse 14. As therefore the tires are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall, and they shall gather out of the kingdom out of his kingdom all things that offend and then we do iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire and there shall be weeping there shall be wailing and gnashing of 
teeth. We're looking at chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I'm reading from verse 30. Matthew chapter 25. Reading from verse 30. And cast ye the profitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 41. It says in verse 41. Then shall you say also unto them of the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels verse 46 and these shall go into everlasting punishment it's very clear from the word of god that all these pharisees all these chief priests that were after jesus christ to arrest him he is the one that will arrest them eventually and at that time the day of salvation will be passed for them and there will be nowhere to hide and i pray that you will be on the right hand side of the lord it's your savior i said it's your savior it's your sanctifier it's your protector and you run into him for refuge. We're looking at John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And I'm reading here from verse 46. John chapter 7. Verse 46. The officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Never man speak like this man. Uh, begin to think of what you have known about the message of Jesus Christ. What he said, what he said about salvation, what he said about righteousness, what he said about when you bring your gift to the altar. You remember that somebody has something against you to leave your gift there. What he said about how to know the Father. What he said about be ye perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And what he said about fasting, what he said about prayer, and what he said about doing good, what he said about your left hand not knowing what your right hand is doing, what he said about humility, what he said about hypocrisy, and what he said about marriage. Begin to think about the message of Jesus Christ and compare it with what any other person has said. No man ever spoke like this man as he reveals himself as the light of the world. As he reveals himself as the one that shed his blood and his blood will be for the atonement remission of the sins of everyone that believes. As he talks about his life that his life is from the Father, controlled by the Father. As he spoke about his victory, the prince of this world cometh and has nothing in me compared to what anybody has said no man ever speak like this man the doctrine of jesus christ a life transforming doctrine a life changing doctrine a heaven a preparing doctrine that prepares you for heaven and you think about all those doctrines of christ no man ever spoke like this man they brought uh, that man on the stretcher and he said son thy sins be forgiven thee no man ever spoke like that it says carry your bed and go back home immediately the power came he carried his bed and went back home no man ever spoke like this man look at this a thief on the cross lord remember me when you come to your kingdom i say unto you today you'll be with me in paradise no man ever spoke like this man i'm eating this with you now but the time is coming i'll eat this with you in the kingdom of god you don't hear that any other place no man ever spake like this man look at his parables his son went forth to sow and some fell on the wayside and some fell among the thorns and some fell among the rocks and some fell on good ground and the one that fell on good ground they brought forth thirty fold and sixty fold and hundred fold no man ever spoke like this man I give unto you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by enemies such you no man ever spoke like this man you tarry in Jerusalem unto ye be and deal with power from on high because not many days from now ye shall be filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost. No man ever spoke like this man. Now go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and lo, I am with you. Moses could not say that. Elijah could not say that. Elisha could not say that. I am with you. Even from now till the end of the world, no man ever spoke like that man. That's why Jesus is unique and he's your savior. I said it's your savior. He is your sanctifier. Is the lover of your soul. You keep to Jesus Christ. The devil will never play around you. And the devil will never fool around you. Because he has power. All power. He will protect you. 
I'm talking to somebody there today. I said he'll protect you. And thank God he'll give you the victory all the way through. In Jesus' name. No man ever spoke like this man. Look at Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 35. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 35. That it may be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will alter things which, were, which had been kept secret from the foundation of the world. I'll alter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That's why when he began to reveal all those things and began to shed light on the things they never knew. That's why those people said, never man speak like this man. We're looking at Luke chapter 4 verse 22. Luke chapter 4 and I'm reading here from verse 22. Luke chapter 4 verse 22. And all bear him witness. All bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceedeth out of his mouth. And they said is not this Joseph's son? They were surprised. They were surprised because never man speak like this man. Look at verse 32. And they were astonished at his doctrine for his word was with power. His word was a power, the power to save, the power to heal, the power to deliver, and the power to turn your life around for the better. As you come to him, the wonder of his word will work in your life in Jesus' name. Verse 36, and they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power, he commanded the unclean spirits, and they come out. I said they come out. Bad luck will come out of your life. The yoke will come out of your life. All the bodies will come out of your life. Listen to Jesus. Never man speak like this man. And when that word comes to you, the word of his power and the word of his wonders and the word of anointing and the word, the word that is able to hold you and is able to prepare you for glory. When that word comes to you, you'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. And it tells us the superiority of Christ is above the Pharisees and above the chief priests. And it was unquestionable in the mind of those officers that Christ is above all men of the past, above all men of the present, above all men of the future. Receive his revealed truth and you'll be wiser than all men without Christ, all men outside Christ. You'll be wise in time, you'll be wise for eternity. I said you'll be wise now and you'll be wise forever. Amen. We're coming back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7. And here now we're coming to point number 3. The division concerning Christ among the separatists. The division concerning Christ among the separatists. We're looking at John chapter 7 from verse 49. From verse 49, or let me let me read here from verse 40, from verse 46. 46, the officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? But these people who knoweth not the law are cursed. They thought they knew. And so they said, all these people that did not know the law, they are cursed. The Pharisees, as you'll find their name mentioned there, Pharisees, Pharisees, Pharisees. And then the chief uh, priests and the rulers, uh, Pharisees were actually separatists. The meaning of Pharisees is separatists. They bound themselves with an oath of religion. That whatever light comes that we have not seen today that we have not seen in the past as pharisees will never accept they bound themselves with the court of tradition that the tradition they were holding is this anybody that comes christ messiah the prophet and the revealer of the truth whatever he says we're not going to accept because they have now bound themselves they locked up themselves in the dark dungeon of unbelief deliberately they closed their eyes they closed their ears to the truth of salvation 
and they sealed their own eternal doom and damnation. Our Lord Jesus Christ warned them, but they rejected the counsel of God against themselves. They chose damnation instead of salvation, and they compelled and they forced millions of people to perish with them. You will not perish with them. I said you will not perish with them. Uh, look at them, look at them. Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23. Uh, they thought they had enough and they had nothing. They, they thought they had enough and they didn't have salvation. They thought they had enough and they didn't have forgiveness of sin. They thought they had enough. They didn't have forgiveness and freedom from sin. And they were satisfied in that. And they bound themselves in their dungeon of ignorance that they're not going to accept any light to come in. We're looking at uh, Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 13. In verse 13, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shall up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. You see that? They were not going into the kingdom of God. They rejected salvation. And any other person wanting that salvation, they blocked their way because of their tradition. They exalted their tradition above the truth that came from heaven. Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7, I'm reading here from verse 5. Mark chapter 7, verse 5. Uh, then the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, uh, Why not? Why walk not the disciples according to the tradition of the elders? Why are you preaching the truth? Why are you preaching salvation? Why are you telling the people another thing apart from what we have told them? How oh, is it your disciples are not walking uh, after the tradition of the elders? Then go, look, at verse, uh, look at verse 6. And he answered and said unto them, Well, Athesias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, These people honoreth me with their leaves, but their heart is far from me. They were not converted. They were not born again. They were not renewed. They were not transformed. Their lives were still as dirty as ever. Outwardly, they were all right. Inwardly, they were so corrupt and sinful. It says, how be it in vain. They worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandments of God. Laying aside the truth of God. Laying aside the sound doctrine of the Bible. Laying aside the life-giving word of God. And the life-transforming word of God. Laying aside the salvation projecting, the salvation producing word of God. God, ye hold the tradition of men as washing of pots and cups, and many other things say ye do. And then, and he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that she may keep your own tradition. Verse 13 making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. See what hindered them and what hinders people today? Tradition. What hinders people today? Denomination. What hinders people today? Religion. What hinders people today? The lies of the false prophets. What hinders people today? Their dreams. What hinders people today? All the falsehood that the false people are telling them. I pray that God will remove that thing from your eyes. And all that uh, shade and all that uh, sin that binds you in darkness, the Lord will break everything away from you today in Jesus' name. And hey, look at chapter 7 of Luke. Luke chapter 7. It's not that they were not told the truth. They were told the truth, but they were so wedded to error. They were so committed to error. They were so committed to evil that they did not want that truth. Chapter 7 of Luke, I'm reading from verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God. They rejected the counsel of God. They refused the counsel of God. And they pushed away the counsel of God against themselves. Against themselves being not baptized of John. It was against themselves. They closed the door. You'll not close the door of heaven against yourself. 
You'll not shut your window against the light of heaven coming through to your heart, to your house in Jesus' name. We're looking at Luke chapter 11, verse 44. Luke chapter 11, verse 44. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are graves which appear not, and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. Look at verse 52. One to you, lawyers, still the Pharisees, the scribes, lawyers. And it says, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye have taken away the key of knowledge. The key of knowledge that will show the knowledge of salvation. The, the key of knowledge that will show the way of eternal life. The key of knowledge that opened the door to heaven. You have taken that key away. Ye enter not in yourselves. And them that were entering in, ye hindered. It's like saying... I'm not saved, or are you going to be saved? It's like saying, I'm sick, I didn't go to Jesus for healing. You're sick, or are you going to Jesus for healing? I'm oppressed, I'm, I, because I'm keeping my doctrine. Our denomination must not hear that I go to another place to hear any other sin that already they have not told me. And so since I'm not going there, my son, you'll not go there, you'll not be saved. My son, I'm not sanctified, you'll not be sanctified. My daughter, I'm not sanctified, you'll not be sanctified. And my neighbor, I don't have it. I don't have the key and the way to get to heaven and you will not get there. And as other people are making effort, I want to go and get saved. I want to go and get the blessing from Christ. I want to accept him and receive him as my Messiah, my Christ, my Savior and my Lord. They said, no, you will not. And they blocked their ways. I pray you'll not be a hindrance. You'll not block the way of anybody from getting into the things of God in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 14. Luke chapter 16, we're reading from verse 14. It tells us here in verse 14, it says, And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. They had a message, they derided him. They had his doctrine, they derided him. They had uh, the way of life, and the way of truth, and the way of life. It was revealing to the people, and they ridiculed him. And he said unto them in verse 15, Yeah, they would justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That's who they were. That's who they were. They pretended they didn't know that Jesus was right. They knew in their hearts of hearts that Jesus was right. But they were saying, if we allow him to go on that way, I will show it publicly that we accept and we affirm and we confirm that he is the Christ, he is the Savior, and that he is the truth. Then the people are going to believe him. And then we lose our position. We lose our faith. And we lose our authority. And we lose the hold we have on the people. What becomes of us, we rather keep our position and keep our authority over them. And they go to hell. That's all right. That's all right. Because we must keep our position by all means. You see? That's what they meant. That's what they said. And that's what they look at this. Look at this in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 47. John chapter 11, verse 47. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees. He counseled and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. They won't accept that publicly. They won't say that publicly. They won't say that in the hearing of the people, in their counsel. In their inner circle, they said, this man doeth many miracles. Look at verse 48. If we let him thus alone, if we leave him and give him liberty to be doing everything he's doing, people are going to get saved. They're going to get miracles. The Romans, and it says, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. So that's what they thought. They said, if we allow him uh, all these miracles, if we allow this to go on, people are going to believe on him. Look at the action in uh, chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 10 and verse 11. John chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Have you heard of Lazarus before? What happened to him? What did Jesus do? 
He raised him from the dead. And because Lazarus came back from the dead, they were telling each other. People were telling themselves, this is the Christ. This is that prophet. There's no doubt about it. Look at this. That man had been dead for four days. And Jesus just went there by the grave. He didn't even touch the stone. They rolled away the stone. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. What happened? Lazarus, tell me. Came forth. And because of that, many believe. Let, let me back up now. To, this is a chapter chapter 12, verse 9. Much of the Jews, much of the much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Jesus, they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. And now when the Pharisees knew that, the people had seen the truth. They seen the light. They now said, ah, we're going to do something. We will put Lazarus also to death because by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. They didn't want people to see the truth. They don't want us to see the truth, but you'll see the truth. I said you will see the truth. And I will come back to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, I'm reading now from verse 15. Nicodemus says unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he was a member of their council, a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was still there. He had gone secretly to see the Lord Jesus Christ, and Jesus had given him the message of life, the message of salvation, and the message of getting to heaven. He must be born again. And now as they were opposing Jesus, Jesus, he had kept quiet. He had been hiding his light under the bushel. He had not spoken about Jesus for some time. And all these people did not know. But now that they were claiming that, uh, you know, Jesus was not right and they were going to hurt Jesus, then he felt compelled to say something. He said in verse 51, does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? And Nicodemus said, why are you judging him? Have you been there? Have you seen him? Have you heard him? Have you seen his word? Have you analyzed his word? Why don't we go there and hear him and see what he's doing before we judge? They answered and said unto him, Are thou also of Galilee? Search and look. For out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. But you know something? They couldn't, uh, you know, conclude. They couldn't go ahead with their plan to take Jesus. Nicodemus, with that one voice that he, he spoke of, he broke up the meeting. You break up the meeting of evil doers. You break up the meeting of conspirators. Look at verse 53. And every man went unto his own house. Many of them went with unbelief. But those of us who are here tonight, you are going with faith. Yeah. You are going with salvation. Yeah. You are going with confidence in Christ. You are going with the authority of the name of Jesus in your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. We are going with the conviction that Jesus is unique. We are going with the conviction that Jesus is the only Savior. is the only sanctifier. is the only baptizer and the only ghost. Not only that, is your personal savior what are you i said it's your personal savior you have that experience tonight in jesus name and every man went unto his own house nicodemus went to his house with conviction and the other people went to the house with confusion i am going back to my house with confidence in god with joy in the lord with assurance of salvation and with the knowledge that if Jesus comes before we meet again, you'll find me up there. Where will you be? Where will you be? Where will you be? You go home with confidence tonight. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll save you and save you forever. Give me a good, good amen now. Rise up and tell the Lord, rise up and tell the Lord, no confusion in my mind, no confusion in my heart, no confusion in my, in my understanding. I believe, I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is unique, is my Savior, the only Savior.